welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. And today our topic matter is exercising for women in a healthy, non-injury causing way for a lifetime. So when we talk about women in exercise, okay, you see, I have a belly dance costume on and later on I'm gonna demonstrate some belly dance moves for women out there. When we talk about women in exercise and the ability to be able to exercise, we're very lucky in our country in that women can go out free and run and play and dance and do all kinds of fun exercises unimpaired with a burqa. So on where you can only see a little bit out the eyes. We're very blessed in this country to be here in the United States to have that option. So as I talk about the exercises for women, remember women, that you have the right and the abilities to do that in this country and hopefully you promote it in other countries where something like the Muslim Brotherhood won't allow you to expose anything but your eyes out in public. Encourage other women throughout the world to enjoy and love their femininity and who and what they are and to maintain their health. So when we talk about exercises for women, oh, we cannot and should not train like men. I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I have trainers, I've been a trainer for over 20 years, that say, you know, women train like men, just the same like men, and it is not the truth. If you want to have a long, healthy lifetime of being well, you've got to train in a little different of a way. Our body structures are different, our muscle mass is different, our tendon and ligaments are different, our hips are different, our body structures are different. So. Um, I have a list of exercises that I know basically throughout a lifetime that you can do with very minimal risks for overall health and well-being because bottom line is exercise is to maintain health and well-being. And yeah, the side benefits are going to be a better appearing body, but a healthy body, a moving body, one that doesn't get arthritis or have issues. Now, that involves some, sort, some form of supplementation, B vitamins, C, your omegas, minerals, all those things that we've had in other discussions. Tonight, I merely want to focus in on exercise options that women should consider that I know will keep their risk factors for injury down. Now, when we look at the list of those types of exercises, I really like you to take a peek. Number one I have on there is some form of strength training. Now, I'm not talking about going in and working with weird types of exercises that I've seen going on in gyms. And they say they're building your core and this and that. And you know what, to be honest with you, all I've seen is injuries coming from that. They'll have you do lunges around the entire gym. Uh, they'll have you bouncing on a ball with weights. I mean, this is absolutely, in my opinion as a trainer, ridiculous, okay? When you're looking for a good strength training program, you're looking for some sort of resistance that's in a very controlled, isolated pattern. So for example, let's set this paper down, you know, you're gonna do your nice, beautiful bicep curls with moderately heavy weight, not too light, you don't swing them. Nice and controlled. When you're working your shoulders, you have moderately lighter weight and you're working controlled with your back supported. You know, when you're doing your legs, you do your leg extensions or your leg curls or your leg presses with control in a moderate level. You can also use uh, stretch bands to do this. Um, I know in, when I teach my yoga classes, we actually have these little um, uh, things that we pull and we bring across in order to work our shoulders. So looking for sensible strength training, not weird things that are gonna get you injured on balls balancing with weights. Ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And in my earlier days of training, we've never exposed women to that. But remember the benefits of strength training are always gonna be bones, muscle integrity, tendon and ligament strength, and the muscles don't jiggle in the wind, the body stays tight. So that when you do perform other exercises, you have the strength and the integrity to perform those other exercises. I love Pilates. I think Pilates is a great exercise choice for women. It's in a controlled arena. Once again, you're not bouncing on balls, you're not doing strange things. You're sitting here 
working in a very, and you can do this mat or machine. It's been around since uh, early 1900s, so it's been around over 100 years. It strength trains, it helps build the immune system, and stretching and flexibility and mobility. Excellent form of exercise for women. Yoga. Now, when I talk about yoga, I'm not talking about going to a gym and doing a, trying to do a headstand the very first day you're there. I'm talking about a good natural flow yoga for stretch where you're doing downward dog, upward dog, you're doing mountain pose, you're doing balance poses, um, you're doing floor movements of stretching, but you're not doing anything that's gonna put you in any danger. Nice, beautiful flow yoga does not put the body in harm and works and stretches. You're not holding positions for a lengthy period of time. You're holding it for three to five breaths. It works great. I have seniors in my class that are 77 years old that we build strength and integrity and change their body composition just by doing beautiful flow yoga with good breath at the end and a little bit of meditation. These types of exercises work on the mind, body, and spirit of a woman. Always going power, 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 power on exercising is going to get you injured, injured, injured. So remembering strength training, flowing, stretching, being beautiful. Now, dance is also a wonderful way to exercise. And you, we've seen all the dancing with the stars and all the fancy movements and everything they do. And there's ballroom dance. There's all kinds of beautiful um, uh, ethnic dances that we learn culturally that are very safe and fun and great for cardiovascular. Those I encourage, wonderful exercise for the cardiovascular, not so much for strength training, uh, but great for the cardiovascular health. Belly dance now, on the other hand, does involve some strength training in that you've got your shoulders up, you know, you're moving your body, you're keeping your arms up, your posture is good. You're going down in, in motions and movements uh, where you're folding down and you're moving and you're using your arms and your hands and you're floating up above and it takes strength and you're moving your hips and you're moving your back and you're doing your legs and you're balancing. It also too is strength training, balance, and a beautiful dance that enables the body to be able to get stronger, more flexible, stay in balance. Great way to strengthen the lower back. It's optional. Now, there's certain things, obviously, in certain exercises that have limitations. If you've got herniated discs in your lower back or in your back period, you're not going to do belly dance. You may be able to do some forms of yoga and Pilates, some forms of strength training, but obviously anything that involves the twisting and turning of the back and that motion, you would be limited to when it comes to most um, types of dance. Now. I've got the list here, um, and it shows up on the board. The very last one I have is trail hiking. Now, I love hiking, good pace walks, you know, where you're really going up. You know, you're, we've got a great mission here in Lompoc. We've got Gaviota Peak that's a real, uh, a more of a challenge. And a good trail hike, you know, with good shoes, always, always having good shoes. That can be a wonderful cardiovascular workout and a leg workout when you're working on the hills and, and back and calves as well. Um, wonderful ways to do that. And there are um, some wonderful trails around in this area. Limited amount of potential injury. Bicycling also, and I don't have this on the list because I figured that was pretty much given, is a great cardiovascular workout. You can use your legs. I do tend to see more injuries, and that's why it's not on this list. I do see, tend to see more injuries involving bicycling with falling, this and that and all. So a um, little less, a little bit more danger, but if you've got great balance and you enjoy cycling around and you've got a great bike, bicycling is also good cardiovascular and leg strengthening for women of, of all ages. Now, I've written a few things on here that I'm seeing as a trainer and that the physical therapists tell me. They're finding, it, they're seeing tons of injuries with. And I'm having a lot of women customers coming in and saying, oh, this is great, this is great. The problem is, is if they want to continue to say, this is great, this is great, until they're 53 years old and beyond, then by gosh, they may better be paying attention. The insanity workouts, the CrossFit workouts, where you've got competition, whether you're competing with yourself or competing with others, where you're doing 100 lunges or you're doing 100 squats. I'm sorry, 
No, no. And people can say you've got great form or whatever, you're gonna get injured. Bottom line, my brother blew out his knee doing CrossFit and he's a fire captain in San Diego. Bottom line, ended up with a good injury to his knee. What do you say? Hey, that's a family close member that I saw. And he's not a competitive individual. He was just competing with himself. Good form, still got injured because of the repetitive motion. Running, now, I think running is great if your body structure is built for it, you've got great shoes, you've been doing it for a while, and you're running sanely and smartly. The problem lies is when I get people out there who are, who've not worked out for a long period of time, who are 50 or 100 pounds overweight, and they go out there and they start running. They're gonna get injured, they're gonna have issues, they can fall, they can slip, it is not a good idea. A nice trail running walk would be a much better option for someone who's trying to get in good physical condition. Now obviously if you're doing marathons, a challenge to yourself, then the risk factors rise obviously with injury. But remember now, we're talking about exercising in which you can do for a lifetime with minimal amounts of injury. Zumba. Boy, oh boy, I hear more knee injuries coming into my store with Zumba and twist ankles, twist knees, back issues. And I know that that is a, a big thing now, but I'm seeing a lot of injuries um, uh, related to that. Also, gym yogas, power yogas, yogas where you're sitting there trying to do handstands and lifting that and whatever else. Unless you're an, a very experienced advanced yoga individual, with a very advanced good instructor, please don't. Don't do gym yoga unless you've got someone who understands they're gonna do a nice flow yoga that is not challenging in that regard. I hope that kind of narrows things down. Remember, this is my opinion only. Um, other people are gonna probably disagree, but I'm 53 years old, no injuries. I can function and do just about every physical activity around, but I do it sanely and I do it smartly. Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show where we're going to work with a little bit of belly dancing for the women out there. Thank you. Hello, this is me, Heiko. We're going to be working on a little bit of a belly dance routine for the women out there. And I'm just going to show you a few ba basic belly dance moves in the next five minutes. And you can try them and practice them, or you can always join us in my studio on Thursday nights at 7.30 at Synergy Studios in Lompoc. And we can play and have fun. Belly dance was for women, made by women, practiced among women. And originally, it was never considered entertainment for men. It was something that was a fun thing that women did between each other and was also a way to aid in a bed childbirth and menstrual cramps and menstrual issues. So it was considered a very feminine, beautiful way and a way to get a woman in touch with her body. So when we do belly dance, it's a way to get in touch with your body and be pleased and be happy with your body. So if you're like me and you know you've had babies and you got a few stretch marks, we call them tiger stripes, which is kind of cool, you know, you've got from being a mommy tiger. But anyway, let me show you a few moves that I think as long as you do not have any herniated discs or back issues, you can try some of the arm movements if you do have back issues, but always with care. So with the music uh, engaging a little bit, we're just gonna keep it real low just to build a little bit of mood um, having to do with belly dance. And what you're going to want to do is you always make sure with belly dance you have a good posture. Okay, so the posture levels always make sure like you've got a book on top of your head. So when we start belly dance, let me start first with a couple of arm movements. So your hands are beside you and bring your arm up. So like you're holding or cradling a ball, so just pretend like you're cradling a ball and you bring it up and you're painting the walls. And you bring it up and you're painting the walls. This is called snake arms. And you can bring the shoulders in and it's a very beautiful central move. You can bring it in the front and you can bring it back out to the side 
and that's called snake arms. Okay, that's a basic belly dance move. Next I want to show you are what are called figure eights. And that's where you bring the hip forward and back and the other side forward and back. That is called horizontal figure eight. You're moving in a horizontal way. Now, you've got a slight bending of the knees when you're doing the hip, but it's a total horizontal move. So just try a little bit of that horizontal-wise, okay? Now, to make it basic, let's raise our hands above our head, and let's just bring the figure eight and just kind of twirl your hands, make them pretty. You're doing your figure eights. Okay, and then, then just maybe hold them out here. Just a really pretty little move. Okay, just figure eight, very, 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 very basic. We learned this in beginning belly dance. Now to bring in a combination. Then we can bring in the snake arms with the figure eight. And look at how beautiful that move is. It's a combination of bringing the tummy around. Okay, and then you can bring your hands back with the snake, slightly back. And mind you now, then you're still doing that figure eight. Now you can lift your heels when you do the figure eight, or you can leave them flat on the floor. You can have your feet wide with the figure eight, or you can have them narrow with the figure eight. You kind of practice and see what feels good for you. Now hands are very, very important in belly dance, and we learn to use them like in snake arms. We learn to use them when we bring our hands in front and down. Once again, now mind you, I'm still doing that figure eight. It's a basic move in belly dance. Joyous and fun. Now when you do this type of dance, as with any type of dance, it's always and should be always approached with joy, femininity. So it gets you in touch with your body. I have ladies come in that cover their tummies and that's okay, it's fine. But getting in touch with your body when you exercise is a very, very important thing. To feel it, to know it, um, oftentimes we'll look at our hands, we'll watch our hands and our movements and our motions. Getting to know your body and what works well with various exercises that you do is a very, very important choice that you make when you figure out which exercises work for you. Next, we're gonna be moving on to the research portion of our show, thank you. Today is Dr. And thank you for that intro. Well, once again, we lead with a store in regards to sugar. And I know sugar's been demonized quite often in the media, but this one's a little bit surprising in regards to sugar and how bad it actually can be, and you never could see signs of its danger. Well, in the article, quote, sugar is toxic to mice in safe doses, dosages. They discovered that the American recommendation, or the recommendation, the amount of sugar that is okay to have in your diet, is about 25% of your calories in the United States itself. Well, they discovered that safe level, which is basically registered in the United States, is not so safe. When they fed mice diets at 25% of the sugar, which would be the equivalent to three cans of soda per day for the average individual, in addition to a perfectly healthy diet, they discovered one interesting thing, that the mice, especially the female mice, who were fed that diet, died at twice the rate of regular mice. And males were a quarter less likely to hold territory, which means because they become lazier, and also less likely to reproduce because they probably become lazier due to sugar. All right, so our results provide evidence that added sugar consumed at concentrations currently considered safe exerts dramatic impacts on mammalian health, mammals being people. In researchers said the study for online publication published in the August 13th Journal of Nature Communications. Even though mice did not become obese and showed few metabolic symptoms, the sensitive test, which a new test they're utilizing, showed they died more often and tend to have fewer babies. What also they pointed out too is shockingly in their words, few compounds, drugs, genetically modified foods, or anything along those lines have any long-term toxicity tests. 
They say virtually none exist. All right, the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation is what funded the study. The diet fed to mice with the 25% sugar. Added diet is equivalent to the diet of a person who drinks just, just three cans of sweetened soda per day if they also had a perfectly healthy diet. After 32 weeks, 35% of the females who had the sugar diet twice died at twice the normal rate, when the normal rate was 17% of the uh, mice. And also, too, there was no difference in deaths between the males, but they did become lazier and died more often. So they basically, on top of that, they said the study found no difference between mice on the regular diet and mice with the 25% sugar-added diet when it came to obesity, fasting insulin levels, fasting glucose, or fasting triglycerides, because they both had the same amount of calories, just different proportions of certain nutrients says that basically our tests show that the adverse outcome from the added sugar diet that could not be detected in conventional tests. Meaning you could feed an animal or person 25% of their calories from sugar and they could look in your eyes perfectly healthy, but in reality, they're rotting from the inside out. So something about when you're considering consuming a few cans of soda per day, that puts you in the sugar herd, and that means you're ready for culling. All right, after that, kind of a sad story and a little disturbing, but the headline goes like this. Six months of fish oil reserves, I'm sorry, I apologize, take that back. Six months of fish oil reverses liver disease in children with intestinal failure. And they said children who suffer from intestinal failure most often caused by a shortened dysfunctional bowel or are unable to consume food orally. Instead, a nutritional cocktail of sugar, protein, and fat made from soybean oil is injected through a small tube into their veins. Now, there's a couple ironies here. One is about the fish oil. The second is about the soybean oil, which we'll come up to. But the soybean oil, which they give these children, which provides essential fatty acids, because they're given soybean oil because they think it's a good source of EFAs, and calories, has been associated with potentially lethal complications known as intestinal failure, liver disease, which requires liver and intestinal transplants. Such a transplant can prevent the death, but the five-year five post-transplant survival rate is only 50%. So the irony here is a dysfunctional bowel, when the children have to be fed through a tubes, they're given soybean oil and sugar as their nutritional uh, supplement through a tube also, which in case causes the intestinal failure and the liver to fail in the whole lineup. So the soybean oil is actually part of the treatment and also part of the disease. All right, previously studies shown replacing soybean oil, probably with just about anything else, with fish oil in intravenous nutrition can reverse intestinal failure associated liver disease. However, the necessary duration of fish oil treatment had not been established in medical studies. So until then, they continued to give the kids soybean oil. Oh, it gets better. Children's Discovery Innovation Institute at Mattel's Children's Hospital at UCLA, which Mattel's obviously a real hospital, has found that compared with soybean oil, a limited duration of 24 weeks of fish oil is safe and effective and this is the words, just replacing cheap soybean oil, safe and effective in reversing liver disease in children with intestinal failure who require intravenous nutrition. The researchers believe that the fish oil may also decrease the, decrease the need for liver and intestinal transplants and mortality associated with the disease. The researcher study called six months of intravenous fish oil re reverses pediatric intestinal failure associated with liver disease is published on the online journal of parental and eternal nutrition but it gets better with this particular study they said the term determine a find out period of time this of course they wanted to give children the six month period of time and see if they could actually reverse liver disease in children and they had some promising results and they use this under the Compassionate Drug Act because obviously fish oil is some sort of drug. All right, because intravenous fish oil is not yet approved by the FDA, it is much more costly than soybean oil. Think about that. Fish, 
Fish oil is how much more costly than soybean oil when it comes to your child's life? That's really a, a, a very telling statement because as medicine becomes more industrialized, yes, pennies will make a difference. And if it's cost a few pennies more to save a life, it's not going to happen. Because listen to this. The FDA has said much more costly than soybean oil. And since fish oil is more costly than soybean oil, it is not covered by insurance. As a result, the oil is considered experimental. We're talking fish oil. And is currently available only under special protocols. Meaning even if you ask your doctor for fish oil, you're not going to get in this case. No matter how dangerous the soybean oil is, it's just too much of a bother to put something different in an intravenous tube. It proved, if it proves safe and effective for patients, we hope it would eventually be available for wider use. It said, and this is what happened when they gave intravenous fish oil to the children with this intestinal uh, dysfunctional bowel and so on and so forth. 80% of patients that received the fish oil experienced a reversal of the liver disease, while only 5% of the soybean oil patients have seen a reversal. And they gave an example. Isabella Pirsky, uh, apologize, mispronounce her name, Pissione, who was one of the first patients at UCLA to receive the fish oil treatment under what's called the compassionate use. Remember I mentioned that earlier. Her outcome of the treatment paved the way for research to establish a six month protocol. Because of multi multiple surgeries due to obstruction in her intestines, Isabella was left with only 10 centimeters of intestine. She depended on intravenous nutrition, if you call soybean oil and sugar nutrition, for her survival, which unfortunately resulted in liver damage. Of course, it's soybean oil and sugar. What do you expect to happen? When Isabella started the fish oil treatment, she was just over six months old and was listed for a liver and bowel transplant. Within a month of starting treatment, her condition started to improve. By six months, her liver had healed and she no longer needed a transplant. Because we cried tears of joy each week we saw her getting better and better, she is a success story. So if any children are suffering from intestinal issues or liver failure, liver compromise, I strongly recommend you do everything you possibly can not to accept the soy oil swill that they give you and push for the fish oil. My time is up. And thank you very much for listening once again. Very right. good. Wow. Thank you very much, Ralph. Well, sorry about the noise in the background. I just was responding to, in horrified fashion to some of the things he stated. So do your research. Uh, once again, our show is available um, through Comcast as well as YouTube.com forward slash VH Film. Thank you very much for joining our show.